Welcome back to Online Off Script, a podcast where we discuss trending marketing topics and all things new on the internet. I'm Sam Olmsted, New Orleans Managing Director at Online Optimism, and today we are finishing our discussion about gaming and technology with Lindsay Poss, Executive Producer and Women in Gaming Lead at Holodeck Media. If you've seen a correlation between the growth of gaming as an industry overall and the advancement of technology, like ha- as technology grows, like is there an expansion in gaming and who's in it? Yeah, so this is a fun question because I think gaming is actually the thing that pushes forward technology in a lot of ways. Um, gaming is the reason why we're even talking about AR and VR. Uh, and it, I think that there is a lot to be said about how gaming pushes the latest and the best and the fastest tech. Because um, if you've ever met a gamer, you know <laughs> that they, they really value hardware, high speeds, good tech specs, advancements, all of that. And it, it's kind of a fun way to get introduced to new tech, right? Like if I put an Oculus on you and said, you have to go to work with it, I don't know that you would learn how to use an Oculus very well. But if I put an Oculus on you and say, here's a dance game, yeah, <laughs> wave your arms, figure out how to play it, then you're much more inclined to actually get used to that technology. So they feed into each other quite a bit. And I don't think gaming gets enough credit for pushing forward technology. That being said, tech is also moving forward on its own. Um, and the better tech gets, the better gaming gets. Yeah, there's no question about that. I have another question about who's pushing who. Do you think that it is like the employees in the tech on like the game side that are pushing growth and ideas? Or do you think it largely comes from gamers and like mods and like stuff that they're doing? Oh, I think it totally comes from gamers. Um, I think that gamers are... I have met so many people in the past couple years doing this that said, oh, I, I saw this thing and it didn't have what I wanted. So I built my own. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, every, every CEO, large, small, whatever is basically like, oh, there was a gap here. I didn't like it. I started my own company to do this thing. Yeah. I mean, wow. it's just, it's amazing. So, and that's kind of a, that's a techie thing in general, but gamers is definitely fall into that category of, I'm just going to do it myself. <laughs> Absolutely. But to your point, is that the employees pushing it or is the gamers? I think one of the, the key points is that the employees are gamers themselves. Yeah. And yeah. so they're pushing whatever kind of they want too, right? They want to, mm-hmm. they want to see this in the game or they want to see this in another game and start a new company or whatever it may be. So they're pushing forward their own kind of and thoughts. You had kind of like inspired this earlier when you're talking about how you, one of your coworkers or someone you knew was getting into blockchain and that's kind of like what led your, um, what are your thoughts on the gaming NFTs? Have you seen so, that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I've actually had several debates about this because Ubisoft announced theirs in just a very, I, would, I don't want to say catastrophic because it wasn't that dire, but just pretty much the worst way you could announce it. Um, So NFTs are a really hot debate right now for a lot of reasons. And I have very mixed feelings on NFTs. I think that it is an incredible way to build a community, to allow people to actually feel like they own something. And, you know, when you get a group of people together who are all interested in the same assets and the same thing, they can get together and they can build these communities and they can talk and they can trade and they can be excited in the same way that we once were excited about art. I just think that there's so many scummy interactions right now with gaming and with NFTs. And if you take away the scumminess, it's a really, really cool technology. So Ubisoft, for example, they decided that they were going to do in-game NFTs, which were only tradable through their also in-game platform. And you had to play an obscene number of hours to get the NFTs that were any uh, worth any value. It was something like 600 hours. And obviously there was massive backlash. And then Ubisoft kind of came forward and said, well, gamers don't really value NFTs yet. And uh, they should they should be excited that we did this for them. It was, it was kind of a weird statement. And the guy made a good point that gamers don't currently value NFTs. But I also don't feel as if companies putting out a product and saying, you have to play 600 hours to get it. And it's not going to be worth anything. And you can only trade it on our platform. It's necessarily a good introduction to this idea of building a community around digital assets that people own. So there's definitely good, I I think that there's a really smart way to do it. I think that you can create a community that cares about owning these things and have them trade them in the same way people cared about owning baseball cards or Pokemon cards 
or bobbleheads or any variety of other little collectibles. I think that it's important to not have astronomical valuations on these collectibles and have wild news stories about the fluctuations in those valuations. And I think that's where that whole concept of NFTs really gets lost. And it makes me a little disappointed because we've just had so many stories <laughs> about bubbles and inflation and stuff. There's so many stories about the high values of them. And, and there's so little understanding in the general population about what they even are. So it's interesting to see that you only see the valuation stories and, and people are still struggling to kind of wrap their heads around what they are. I know that, you know. I also feel like there's not enough regulation around them. Like there was that guy who was like doing some and he said that money was going to go to charity and then he literally tweeted and he was like, change my mind, it's all going to my wallet and then deleted his Twitter account. Yeah. There's some weirdness yeah, behind it, is, I think. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, tech tech policy is is famously behind tech advancement. Um, so that's, and that's a huge question for regulators, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> Do you think there's some like vulnerability in the like gaming NFTs? Because I know that like children obviously love gaming, spend a lot of time doing it. Do you think that that leaves like a vulnerability open? That they're going to like not yet be motivated yeah. into them? No, I mean, I think with those kinds of arguments, you can also say the same thing about the kids who take their parents' credit cards and spend $3,000 on Amazon. So oh, that's yeah. absolutely <laughs> who I'm thinking of is those children. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Or the in-app purchases or, any... or something like that right. on, on phones. I had to coach my niece real hard that if something pops up, you show me the button before you press exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I don't necessarily think that NFTs are any better or worse than any other ways that kids can find to spend money. Um, and I, I don't think that there's a huge... I mean, frankly, they're a little bit difficult to trade right now, too. They're a little bit difficult to buy and trade. Like, there's you have to kind of know what you're doing. I mean, OpenSea is a great platform, but OpenSea is basically permanently trending on Twitter for bugs and fixes and issues. And I, I would be sort of surprised if a five year old opened a crypto wallet. Yeah. <laughs> if a five year old got through the steps of opening a crypto wallet and spending a bunch of money on, on blockchain transactions. I can't. Wait to see that headline. Yeah, yeah you never know. <laughs> right. It will happen, I'm sure. But as of, as of right now, I think that there's a, it's a little bit too hard. It's a little, the accessibility is a little too low. And I don't think that there's no sort of risk of, I don't know, gambling problems or some of the other things that we've seen in gaming right now with NFTs. I can't see the parallel there. Yeah. Awesome. So next question is, do you think that esports and video game streaming are a secure career path it's like asking if pro sports are <laughs> i would say like both the athlete side and the like your side of it like the business side the business side is a lot more secure <laughs> <laughs> um it is hard to be one in a million when it comes to becoming a pro streamer people who manage it are doing great and yeah it's very secure once you get there but getting there i mean i think it's something like 94 percent of twitch creators make under 300 dollars a month from twitch or so I, Again, I don't remember the exact number. I just read a report the other day about it. Um, but the point is that the vast majority of people streaming on Twitch, like well over 90%, are not making a sustainable living off of it. Um, has to be a labor of love. You have to have some talent, a mixture of talent and luck. Um, and to me, it's very similar to being a professional athlete. It's what, like 2% of college, college players become pros at something. So similar with streaming combination of talent and luck and meeting the right people and getting yourself out there in the right ways but also have to have the personality and the time and yeah and, yep. and just promoting yep. it and everything like that as yeah well. yeah it's so much work mm -hmm. um Lindsay, we touched on this a little bit but when we talk about gaming in different global markets um how do you think it's it's treated across across the entire world and and where do you think the big push is coming from and who's accepting it the most and just what are your thoughts on how gaming has become a, a global industry? Asia has always historically led the way on this. Mm -hmm. um, they were kind of the first ones to have really intense professional leagues. There is a lot more infrastructure built around gaming from cafes to internet connections to, I mean, everyone in South Korea has a good internet connection. And StarCraft has even been on public television for 15 or 20 years now, um, StarCraft tournaments. 
So Asia has definitely been the one that's leading the way. When it comes to the rest of the world, there's a lot of opportunity in developing countries to do more, um, especially now that phones are so ubiquitous. I think that there's a lot more developing countries jumping on board. So a lot, a lot of people who are very excited about this kind of web 3.0 and blockchain based gaming idea in developing countries as a way to mine cryptocurrencies, um, kind of making it a job. There is a whole debate around that for good reason. So I don't want to get too deep into yeah. that, but just a note to say that there's a lot of people out there excited about blockchain gaming in developing countries. We're seeing huge amounts of investment in Western countries, of course, and in the Middle East. I think the Middle East is really, really actually in large ways uh, leading us into the into the new era of gaming. And they have the obvious geographic advantage of being very near the Asian markets. Yeah. So, <laughs> so they could do that. <laughs> that kind of touches on my next question, which is how do you think cultural differences affect the gaming industry as well? I mean, you mentioned the impact of mobile devices and kind of that exploding as a market itself. But do you think there are other differences that um, come about in the gaming industry? It's hard to pinpoint exactly what those are, but I think globally and as a whole, and this is, a, this is actually the exact opposite of your question because it's what similarities do we see across the globe? I think, but I do think as a whole, people are exploring how to use their free time in different ways. And a lot of that could be social media driven, but a lot of it is just because we have much greater access to technology across all income levels, across all genders, across all races, across everyone. We just have way more access to technology. When it comes to differences, I would have thought, if you had asked me this question two months ago, I would have said that countries that have more authoritarian regimes and are much more socially conservative are going to have more difficulty in adopting gaming or getting a thriving gaming ecosystem going where a lot of funding is being poured into gaming and tech. However, Saudi Arabia has basically flipped that entire idea on its head in the past month with just tons of investment and uh, companies and stories about that. So they've invested in companies think, themselves in Saudi Arabia or, or oh yeah. other countries. Oh yeah, other countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, in other countries as well. They actually just bought a big esports platform, um, if I remember correctly. There's been about I don't know if you all have been following. I don't know how often how much you guys follow gaming news, but in the past month, there's been like five huge merger announcements. So I'm. <laughs> I'm sort of struggling to remember which one is which, but I'm nearly positive Saudi Arabia, and I can Google it really quick, um, bought a huge tournament platform. It was uh, EGL or EGL, ESL. I can't remember which one. It's okay. Uh, I only anyways. know about EA Sports because <laughs> they make the sims. So, so will that make Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia a major player in the gaming industry, or is this them just getting their toe in the water? What, where do they stand kind of globally? So they are, they have had the vision funds, um, for a while now. I, I don't know if you all follow the WeWork story in 2019. Oh yeah. But the Saudi Arabia backed or yeah, Saudi Arabia or venture fund. Again, now I'm mixing up all my funds because they're <laughs> soft bank and Masa Sones fund. And I, that might be the vision fund, but regardless, Saudi Arabia basically took a lot of its capital and put it into a venture fund, um, in the in the late teens, I believe. And so they have been looking out for future tech projects ever since. I sort of thought that their social conservatism and the authoritarian government was going to keep them out of gaming for a while, just because gaming has a lot of negative connotations, I think, still, even though all those are total BS. And if anyone <laughs> plays Animal Crossing, they yeah. absolutely know that. Um, not everything is all death and violence and blood. And in fact, a very small portion of it is. But anyways, I thought that would kind of keep them out of it. So I have been pleasantly surprised. And I, I think that there's a lot happening around the Middle East that is now getting attention. So it's not just Saudi Arabia. It's the UAE. It's Qatar. It's all of those places. Bahrain even kind of forward thinking, um, wealthy Middle Eastern nations that are now looking into gaming, gaming opportunities, trying to sort of become the new Silicon Valley type of thing. Um, but for gaming specifically. Which has been a super interesting development to me because, again, I thought the social conservatism would kind of hold that back. Um, 
And if you would ask, again, if you would ask me this two, three months ago, I would have had a totally different answer and been like, yeah, I don't know all the countries that tend to historically be very misogynistic and hold people back are not going to do great in gaming. But I've just been completely proven wrong on that hypothesis. So so speaking of misogyny, um, great <laughs> segue in. How do you think that the gaming culture has progressed around its feeling towards women? And like, are you feeling optimistic about that? And I honestly, like how you've talked about how like the mindset around who is a gamer has changed. So do you think that it's just grown and that it's like, yes, more games that women play make them gamers? Or do you think that there's an actual like change in like, yes, even the games that people think of stereotypically towards men are more accepting towards women now? So this is, I talk a lot about this on my podcast, which is called the Meta Woman Podcast. Everyone should go like and subscribe. (laughs) Um, We go through a lot of this and the general consensus from a lot of the people that I've interviewed is that things are improving, but they are not where they need to be at all. And I think that that's sort of where we're at. When it comes to games accepting women more often, it's one of the other things I've been learning about is it's just really hard to undo 10 years of really bad, toxic culture. And even with all of these reckonings, and I know I've talked a lot positively about companies trying to do DEI initiatives. A lot of those companies do it in a fairly empty way and they still need to be (laughs) held accountable and are not making great moves. I'm sort of hoping they wake up and realize that DEI does equal ROI. It comes actually following through on that. There's been a lot of big talk lately. We'll see what happens. Do you find that most of that change the like genuine changes coming from like smaller and like art house studios versus like the big producers. Oh, no. Art house studios can be just as bad and gross. Oh, they're not um. even. I feel like they at least have more control because there's less people to stand in the way. <laughs> oh, but there's also way more incentive to just keep people on if you like them too. Yeah. Oh, the founder did something wrong. Well, too bad he's the founder. That's um, fair. Yeah. So there's there's problems at all levels, and I don't think that any level is doing it any better than any other. Um. I, things are definitely improving. Where things are improving are with new games that are introduced, Valorant, for example, shooter game, typically a male-dominated kind of genre. Valorant did an excellent job from the beginning of building a really inclusive environment. There's a lot of all-female pro-Valorant teams. There was an immediate, there was immediately very heavy moderation, even on chat. Oh. Um, like voice chat, I mean. There's yeah. Heavy, heavy moderation. And that's the same company that has League of Legends. And League of Legends is just like the most toxic cesspool of comments. But the reason why is because League of Legends was released, you know, 15 years ago-ish. The now. culture's and ingrained. It's ingrained. Yeah. yeah. You can't undo that. And it takes a lot of time. Whereas Valorant, they started, they knew what they were doing. They've learned a lot in those 15 years. And they launched something that was really, really open it towards a lot of different people. So... There's definitely a question of there's been a lot of new companies that have arisen that are taking the right approach, but those ones that have always been kind of ingrained, they're entrenched in their ways, they're having a lot more difficulty pivoting, and I find a lot of their pivots to be sort of empty. So generally, things definitely moving in the right direction. Um, A lot of women I've talked to are saying it's moving much more slowly than they thought it would or than they wished it would. And a lot of companies are still really reluctant to kind of let go of the people who are maybe helping shape the culture at the top. So hopefully, I'm hoping in three to five years, we're having a way different conversation about it. But for now, it's just been a lot of reckoning and not a lot of real lasting change, I think. It's like, sure, they're clearing the bar, but the bar is still way too low. And I think podcasts like yours, Lindsay, are going to help out with that. Like, you know, just making it more inclusive, more inviting, and just bringing more women into the fold. That's what I'm hoping. I had a really wonderful guest named Christina Amaya. She's the founder of Latinos in Gaming. And she had sent a chart that I thought was really indicative of the experience that a lot of women and minority hires go through, which is basically that a company says, we're going to do better with diversity. You know, they hire a woman, they hire a minority woman. The minority woman comes in, says, you need to change this, this, and this. They say, we're not going to change anything. The minority woman starts to feel really outvoted, pushed out, and winds up leaving two years later. Right. And I think that that's a, a cycle that happens a lot with these sort of quote unquote diversity hires where you're hiring someone to say that you did it, not to impact meaningful change. Right. Yeah. So I'm, 
I, I'm still hopeful that there's companies out there that want to bring on this change and aren't just filling their own heads with all of these ideas. But until we actually see women and people of color and other minorities in positions of power and able to speak freely and able put to fully implement their ideas, we haven't gotten to where everyone is bragging about that they've gotten to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so my next question is about traditional sports and esports. Um, how do you envision their relationship growing? So every league has had a different approach. Um, I definitely think that the NBA has done it the best, but I'm also a huge NBA fan, so I'm totally biased when it comes to Who is it? Josh Hart? Is he the one? He's like streaming all the time. Yeah. He streams like crazy. Yeah. Um, hilarious. But there's several of them. I mean, yeah. Grayson Allen's actually, he, for a short while, was one of the top 500 Apex players uh, in the country, which is a huge accomplishment. So... But other than that, the NBA also started their companion 2K league. So they have NBA 2K, a companion league that goes along with a lot of the professional teams. I believe like 20 or so of the franchises have signed on to have this companion league, which is really cool. Um, They're also the ones who have, if if you all have seen commercials for the Oculuses, it's like watch an NBA game in VR. Yeah, they The NBA has truly embraced a lot of the tech and has remained really agile when it comes to incorporating it into their own fan experiences, which has been really cool. Do you think that is that basketball fans are more inclined to video games naturally, or do you think it's because of that partnership that lots of basketball fans are inclined to video games? No, I think that basketball itself is just a lot more adept at handling issues. Mm -hmm. Um, So even social justice issues, all of that, they haven't, they haven't had near the, the same leadership that the NBA has had really talented leaders at the top for several years now who have supremely helped the league um develop and you can when you compare and contrast with the nfl it's very clear what those differences are i mean just the international poll alone the nba isn't necessarily the most popular sport in america but it it is probably the third most popular sport worldwide which is a huge testament to its leadership um so that's I just huge basketball fan, love the NBA. Yeah. But anyways, that's it. That's a huge testament to them where I think that professional sports and esports kind of collide. It's a little bit of a tough question. The NFL just announced a partnership with a team. I think a lot more pro sports leagues are looking to use video games as a way to interact with fans. So the NFL has done a lot of like, you know, Madden tournaments for fans or things like that, or they'll bring players in to play video games with fans because that's a kind of a medium where, an insanely good athlete can connect with a more average person who might be really good at video games. So those physical barriers are much lower. Um, I sort of, the traditional sports and esports get compared a lot. And I don't know that that's fair to either one because I just think that they're very different models. Esports has sort of tried to follow the pro sports model and it hasn't been wildly successful. And I think that's because video games are ubiquitous. They're available anywhere. They're available to anyone of any skill level. Um, in a way that sports maybe aren't, you know, in a certain level of basketball, you just can't be tall enough anymore. There's no getting around it. Being in New Orleans, I had no chance to learn hockey growing up. No. <laughs> exactly. But you have a phone. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> right. So it's just, it's, it's a little, it's a little weird to compare them when it comes to pro versus pro. I think they're just completely different. And I think that it, pro esports has a lot to its both its its aid and its detriment has a lot more possibilities for how it organizes itself. Um, what we've seen happen is that there hasn't been a dominant organizational strategy thus far. And what I mean is there isn't team-based models that everyone is super, super pumped about and really into that have been wildly successful. Or there isn't a single tournament every year like FIFA where everyone just shuts down and everyone watches that for video games. But there's a lot more possibilities and flexibilities because of the nature of the content itself pro sports is a little bit more rigid and how you actually have to play and organize because you need specific physical uh um uh, what's the word i'm looking for attributes um you need specific physical attributes not only in the players but in the fields of play themselves so it comes to comparisons the nba is doing it the best in terms of their partnership with them i don't think you can compare and contrast them themselves as in pro versus pro because i think that esports has a lot wider range in what they can do that also means that they haven't done as well as pro sports at the moment um but in 10 years i think that we'll be talking about that much differently 
And there is ways to do companionships and partnerships that are play to the strengths of both pro experiences. And yes, I do think the Olympics will have gaming. Yeah, I was gonna say, like, do you think that there could be like an introduction of like an e-game segment at the Olympics? Yep, absolutely. I think it's, I mean, honestly, the IOC is an incredibly corrupt organization that has been very poorly run for years and years and years. It's like one of the most corrupt, IOC and FIFA are like horribly corrupt. And at some (laughs) point, fans are going to get tired of that. Yeah. Um, And gaming is also just such a natural way to bring in most fans. It's something I, I keep, I feel bad because I keep spitting out numbers that I've read and I don't remember the exact ones. But there is a statistic out there that says over 90% of Gen Z are, are gamers. Mm. So oh, I believe if you that. want to bring more fans to the Olympics, add gaming. Why not? Yeah. But is it Winter Olympics or Summer Olympics? I think it would be its own. Is it Cloud event. Cloud Olympics? I think it separates. It's something It's something out there. It can have it at both. It can be the first crossover. So, you know, the big red flag parent. I wasn't allowed to play video games growing up because um, people talk about addiction, um, it influencing how people behave, video game abuse. Do you see a real risk in that? Or do you think it's uh, like over exaggerated by the media? So there's been just study after study after study that disproves this theory. On its face, I can understand why parents are concerned about violent video games. However, there's about a thousand different ways to interact with games, violent or nonviolent. And it, it's the same thing as anything else. If, anything if else. If you're too much junk food. Mm. Yeah. I mean, too much, even like you can overdo exercise and running, right? You, I mean, ev- what's well, Oscar Wilde? Everything in moderation, including moderation. <laughs> yeah. But no, I, video games are such a, And I'm a former athlete, right? So I can say this with authority. (laughs) Video games are such a wonderful way to teach collaboration, teamwork, quick decision-making, confident decision-making, all of these skills that you might get from traditional sports. It allows you to connect with people around the world in a way that uh, traditional sports don't. I could never go play for a basketball team where I had people from Spain and Brazil and Sub-Saharan Africa, all on the same team with me at the same time in the same place. There's so many components about video gaming that can be done well and be done properly and just make a kid's experience and education so much better. And I also, I get a little, not tired, but a little exhausted of the, um, addiction debate. And I've heard, I've had friends of parents say like, oh, all my teenage son wants to do is play video games. And it's like, listen, if your teenage son was in a bad place before video games existed, they, they would still be in a bad place. Like maybe they would just be laying around all day. It doesn't matter like that bad. It's not, oh, I'm choosing between being, doing video games and doing all my schoolwork that I feel like doing. It's I'm in a bad place and I can only motivate myself to do this one thing. There's other issues at stake. Before video games were around, people ran into those problems, right? (laughs) So I don't think it's inherently the fault of any games. There is, of course, addiction tactics within games the same way there is within social media. We're all learning how to live with technology Mm -hmm. um, in every facet of our lives. I don't think video games are any better or worse. And I actually think that video games have the real chance to, when applied properly, really teach a lot of people who and reach a lot of people who wouldn't have other otherwise been taught and reached. So I absolutely tire of this debate because everything says otherwise. And it feels like a whole bunch of people just sort of digging in their heels and not accepting where we're moving forward with, with the future. Um, one of the coolest things that I've attended a couple of gaming conferences, one of the coolest things that really show the power of using technology. I remember going to a conference a couple of years ago where Um, chemotherapy patients were being trained in virtual worlds to help deal with symptoms and side effects of chemotherapy. And it turned out that spending a long time in a virtual world that was set to be look and and mostly just look very cold Mm -hmm. actually helped decrease things like hot flashes. Wow. There's it's the, the technology is amazing. So just to write it off because it's scary and it's new is ridiculous. Um, And I think that you're really selling yourself short and you're selling your kids short when you do that kind of stuff. There's always going to be mental health issues. There's always going to be people that use gaming as a crutch. 
I think it's more important to address the root of those issues the same way we would have had to before gaming existed than it is to just blame gaming and say it's all gaming's fault. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. And I'm so happy to hear that from an expert because <laughs> uh, that's how I feel too. And I yeah. think that gaming is a great way to introduce technology to people and really foster that collaboration and exploration that you're talking about. Yeah. I feel like the question isn't why is, or like, or the issue isn't that gaming is a crutch. It's that they're going to need a crutch, whatever right. it is, they're going to find something as an avid reader. It's weird because my, I'll be reading and my parents are like, Oh, I don't want to bother you. You're reading. But if mm -hmm. I was playing a video game, they'd be like, Oh, I'll bother you. You're playing a video game. Right. right. Absolutely. I had the exact same thing growing up. My siblings used to tease me because I sort of used to get out of housework because I would just read and read and read and read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh, sorry, I'm building my brain. <laughs> <laughs> and th the thing is, there's there's ways to have – it was so funny to me that my parents always believed I was always improving myself no matter what I read. And I was reading total crap, you know? <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah. I read good books too, but it's like I read plenty of books that were absolutely wastes of time that taught me nothing. And were I'm just reading just Princesses and Fairies. <laughs> right, like, come on. Yeah. And so it's just incredible to me that you would then not have the same feeling about gaming where it's like, oh, this could teach a really valuable skill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the same way reading can. Yeah, anyways, that's a whole... A whole debate, but <laughs> I feel strongly about it. The culture yeah. culture seems to be shifting, hopefully, and yeah. I think that you're helping with that, Lindsay. So, um, <laughs> thank th you. thank you for that. Um, I think we're going to wrap up here, but I do want to make sure to open up the floor to you, Lindsay. I mean, is there, is there anything that you want to chat about, promote, um, you know, talk about on this on this podcast? Because we want to make sure we um, make sure people know about your podcast and and everything that you're up to. Yes, if you want to learn more about gaming, please go listen to the Meta Woman podcast. That's M-E-T-A. It's called the Meta Woman podcast, but really we make a podcast for everyone. We talk a lot about building the metaverse. Again, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> I am definitely a metaverse skeptic who talks a lot about the metaverse, so it's a lot of fun. Um, you can always find me there. I'm also on the Business of Esports live after show. That's live on Wednesday nights. You can find that on any Business of Esports social channel. Um, and then you can find me. I am at Lindsay Poss. That's L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-P-O-S-S -S, on Twitter and LinkedIn. And I am Lindsay the Boss on Instagram. So I love, love that. Yeah. Everyone reach out to me. Talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, that was amazing. Super informative. Really appreciate it. And uh, we will make sure to like and subscribe your, to your podcast as well. And, uh, and thanks for joining us. Thank That's you it. for having me. It was an honor. All right. Bye, Lindsay. Thank you for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast. And if there's anything you'd like to hear us discuss, reach out on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And as always, stay optimistic. Stay optimistic.